You're listening to the Horror Spot Podcast. I'm doing it! Who's gonna lead him? Don't oh, let's go, run! Come on, Les! Come on, buddy! Come on, you physical specimen! Taste the dough, boy! You gotta taste me! Your rules, not mine, baby! I'm getting tired! What the fuck? God. Come on, Les. Come on, Les, man. Look at me. Look at me, Les. Look at me. Let me see you. Let me see you. Look at me, man. It's fucking Todd. It's Todd. In it together. We're fucking doing this thing together, man. It's Todd. Come on. Come on. Come on! Wait! Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Horror Spot Podcast. I'm Blake. And I'm Nick. If you haven't checked out our last episode, I'll put that in the link in the description. The description. The link in the description below. Uh, I don't even know. What, what episode is this? I don't even know. I don't know. Uh, he's having a stroke, guys. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I'm just having a strong. I think it's episode five? Yep, episode oh, five. Oh, we're finally getting to the good ones. Yeah, we're, we're moving on up in numbers. Uh, well, why don't you introduce episode yourself, Episode six Dan? is my favorite. And I'm Dan. And actually, we've got a little surprise for you. At the end of this episode, uh, we sat down with Nathan Basil, star of Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, uh, <clears> to <throat> have a little chat and talk about the movie. Super nice guy, by the way. Just want to get that out of the way. Very, very nice guy. I was happy to have him on. Yeah, he was a great guest because he just kept answering our questions and didn't leave us like hanging on answers. So. Oh, for sure. Well, I mean, it was just like sitting down and talking with yeah, it was a friend, like super right? casual. So hopefully, we can get some more people on. All right. So what do we what do we got here today? What are we doing? Well, so behind the mask, if anybody has not seen this movie yet, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, came out in two thousand six, and it's kind of I don't know what would you what would you call it? Would you call it like a meta, meta horror? Slasher. Probably meta slasher. It's cream of the crop meta subgenre of horror. Like it's one, it's top three easily. Absolutely. Uh, so basically, the premise goes: there is this guy named Leslie Vernon who invites a documentary crew to film him, but Leslie Vernon wants to be the next like psycho horror mm-hmm. slasher. So in this universe, if you will, uh, basically all the great slashers are real people. So like Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger, uh, Billy from Black Christmas. Oh, we're gonna talk about that. Oh yes. Um, and Leslie wants to be the next one. He wants to be the next big guy. So uh, basically the documentary uh, film crew follows him around. He shows them a little bit of the tricks of the trade. And, well, it doesn't go quite as planned for the documentary crew. Uh, it goes perfectly for him, almost. Or maybe it does. Well, uh, that depends. I mean, yeah, I mean, kind of definitely sets it up for a sequel. Well, yeah, he <laughs> did say uh, he'll either, either be dead uh, on the run or incarcerated, so I guess... Uh... All right, so as far as the particulars go, so uh, as far as the main cast, um, we've got, of course, Nathan Basil as mm-hmm. Leslie Vernon. Um, Angela, I'm probably going to Goth- butcher Goth- this, Goth- Angela Gothels, <laughs> yeah, as Taylor. Um, we've got Robert England, Robert veteran. of England, dude. Robert England, that's right. Um, as Doc Holleran, uh, which I believe is a throwback to The Shining, a Dick Holleran, Doc Holleran. Oh, yeah, right. I hope so. Now I hope so. <laughs> Me too. Uh, Scott Wilson, the late great Scott Wilson, as Eugene, uh, who we're going to talk about here uh, in regards to Billy from Black Christmas. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. Um, another uh, genre great, Zelda Rubenstein, uh, famous for being in Poltergeist. Um, who else do we got here? We got Bridget Newton as Jamie. And, you know, a bunch of other people. Uh, you know, we got the documentary film crew. We got a lot of, you know, people. I'd say Kelly's just... pretty important. Kate Miner. Yeah, Kelly is pretty important. Let's see. Who else do we got? We got Ben Pace as Doug and uh, Britton Spellings as Todd. 
And then First we've all, got a bunch of other Todd people, too. Todd is such an asshole, okay? I hate Todd. Todd is an asshole. Oh, and the other thing that was really interesting, Kane Hodder makes a cameo yep, in this as well as, yep, as the guy at the Elm Street house. Oh, I always right, found that right. to be a little hilarious. Yeah, that was. I thought that was great how, you know, first of all, I just want to say, um, before we go any further, <clears throat> I saw this movie probably early, early to mid-teens when I was really getting into horror and uh it kept getting recommended to me and like i'd watch trailers and look into it and have no goddamn idea what it was about like it's so confusing if you don't just watch it without having any bias like it's so it like it'll shock you it's the weirdest movie ever but well it's not the weirdest movie ever but the premise is so confusing like it really is um i remember picking this up at a hollywood video yeah i'm that old uh you know this was back in two you yeah, right, me too. Um, yeah, I mean, this was back in 2006 when this movie came out, so it probably had to have been around 2007 or so, 2008 maybe. Um, but I saw it, and I was like, wow, this looks really goofy, right? Because the mask is a little not what you would expect from your typical horror slasher mask. Um, but just out of curiosity, I picked it up, watched it, fucking loved it. Uh, was real happy to learn that a lot of the filming locations were in Oregon, where I'm at, including my hometown of St. Helens, uh, Oregon, um, which unfortunately was host to some Twilight filming, um, and fortunately a little film called Halloween Town, which you Disney fans out there know exactly what I'm talking about. Hey, you about. know what? Back in my day, when I was a youngster, I liked me some Halloween Town. Dude, Halloween Town is awesome. In fact, they still have the giant pumpkin from Halloween oh, really? Town. That's awesome. Out in yeah, out in St. Helens, and mm. they do this thing every year called the Spirit of Halloween Town, and they cart out this giant pumpkin and put it in the, the the town square, right? Every year, it's awesome. They have a huge um, uh, hocus pocus thing going on down there because that's where that was filmed. Does uh, do they get anybody from the, the oh movie yeah, Mick, to come Mick down? yeah, everyone, the entire cast, everyone goes down. All the production crew, Mick Garris, makes sure he goes down every year. I'm I'm definitely going next year. I want to see Mick Garris so bad. Yeah, they would get people from Halloween Town to come down uh, to St. Helens, so they would get the the gal who played Marnie. Um, I don't remember if Debbie Reynolds ever showed up or not. Oh, that would be so um, awesome. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, so they'll, they'll get that stuff going every year, which is cool. Thankfully, nobody from Twilight ever showed up again, uh, but you know, punches, whatever. Punches. <laughs> right? All right. So Nick, what did you like about this movie? Um, so I like how it's very subtle between the planning process plus, uh, or opposite to when he's executing. So at the end of the movie where, um... Taylor, uh, she comes into the equation and then it becomes third person instead of first with the documentary. That was by far my favorite part where it actually becomes real for them and it becomes cinematic. Yeah, absolutely. I thought that was a very smart choice uh, for them to do. Uh, well, I enjoyed the fact that it wasn't gory, <clears throat> like for the most part. Well, it yeah, was... it was like Halloween gory to where it left it up for the imagination. Yeah, which I thought was fantastic, which is why I liked Halloween in the first place, was it just wasn't blood and guts and shit everywhere. Yeah. And it wasn't scary, and it put you in the mindset of, like, what would a serial killer do? Yeah. So that would harken back to, like, Michael's antics at the beginning of uh, Halloween, how he, like, takes Judith's headstone. And yeah, and with this period. movie, it explains how all mm -hmm. that stuff is executed and whatnot. Um, yeah, I think that was one of my favorite parts about it where, well, of course it was on a, like a super shoestring budget, so they couldn't afford all the extravagance of a slasher movie, even though this is a slasher movie in its, in its own right, but it did it smart like Halloween did it. Not with the ambience, ambience, but with leaving it to the imagination, like when he snaps Todd's neck, like you don't actually see him do anything or... Or even when he goes, oh, actually, another great part, when he is in the bedroom or the like the side room to the bedroom with Taylor and the camera guy and he opens the curtain mm -hmm. really quick and closes it and kills him. Like, you don't see it, but the noises are so real sounding and you, you know what's going on in there. Obviously, you'd have to be an idiot not to, but I like the way they kind of hinted at it. Right, for sure. And like in that scene in particular, I like how the camera crew finally kind of realizes, you know, oh, shit, this is real. Yeah. He just fucking killed these people um yeah see what, what really bugged me about that was taylor was so annoying she knew what was going on she knew it was gonna happen she helped for fuck's sake right and now she's just ah eh, you know maybe we shouldn't no 
you're in it, okay? You can't just back out. He's you just saw him kill people. You think he won't turn on you? Are you serious? Yeah, totally. And I mean, that was his his game the entire time. Well, uh, well, I got a Taylor. question for you, right? So, do you think that he just knew ultimately that even if Taylor didn't get involved, he was going to kill her, or did you think he expected her to get involved and try to like resolve the situation? I think ultimately Leslie Vernon probably expected her to try and stop him. Um, I mean, his predictions you know, were pretty accurate, so it wouldn't be too far fetched to assume that. Yeah, totally. And I mean, it just it it makes sense, you know, with like a lot of horror tropes and stuff like that. The, you know, the ultimately whittling everybody down to it's just Taylor, so she is the final girl. Um, you know, so it was almost pitch perfect the way he he did it i believe and i think that was part of his plan uh to do that all along whether he knew uh that the original intended target was not going to be the final girl or not i think he did um because i mean he had to have been you know doing his research for like ever to get to this point so well i think I'm, he knew i th he must have known that kelly wasn't a virgin first of all because he was so like Okay, so when the, when they're like scoping out the school, he has he says he has that connection with that first girl. Like he he was it almost seemed like he was considering that instead of Taylor right there while she was in the car. So obviously he has a feeling about these people that he's going after. I know this was his first like go at it, or who knows if it even was. We don't even know at this point. But uh, I think he knew better, and I think he knew that it was going to be Taylor no matter what. Right, for sure. And uh, yeah, who knows if it was even his first go at it. Because remember, when Robert England shows up as Doc Holleran, he's like, yeah, that guy's not Leslie Vernon. He's actually this guy, and he's you know deeply disturbed and blah, but, blah, blah. But Leslie did confirm that he was his doctor in a hospital, and who knows what he was in that hospital for. He could have did something when he was a kid. Yeah, exactly. Let's talk a little bit about um, the genre greats uh, that are in this movie. So, I mean, everybody in this movie is great, right? Nathan Basil is amazing. Um, I like how his persona as Leslie Vernon just, you know, he's this great, kind, kind of weird guy at first. But then, like, as the night progresses and he gets into killer mode, it's just snap. Oh, totally different. Absolutely. You know, we'll right. go into I mean, the broads and the bros, but let's put the greats up on their pedestal like they deserve, and we'll talk about them for a bit. Absolutely. So, I mean, first and foremost, um, you know, we should give respect where respect is due to uh, Scott Wilson, um, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Uh, Scott Wilson plays a character named Eugene um, in this movie, who is Leslie's uh, mentor. He, you know, is like a former slasher killer himself, but is retired you know, lives in seclusion with his wife. But in the horror community, there are rumors that he is Billy from Black Christmas. And, so what do you think about that, Nick? And you know what? I've been looking into it, and we got some quotes, okay? So oh, according really? to David J. Stevie, or Steve, the original writer of the screenplay, right? This is a quote from him. I can confirm that Eugene has always been Billy in my mind. Scott Wilson would be the right age for him, and it would always fit for me that Eugene would have that old-school nostalgia and slight professional jealousy that even though he was a pioneer in the business of fear, uh, he never achieved the fame or notoriety of his su bleh, successors, Michael, Jason, etc. He continues, that's just me. However, it was never explicitly written into a draft. It was always just a lore that Scott Glosserman and I carried with us. So, in my mind, that confirms it. He wrote the original Yeah, man. Play. Hell yeah. I mean, if it's coming from the writer that Eugene is Billy, then Eugene is Billy. Yeah, I mean... And I think that's yeah, great. That's that's it. He is. In my mind, he is. He was anyway, but he is now for sure. Oh, for sure. And especially since, like, Black Christmas doesn't really seem to get as much love as it really should get. Yeah, I that's mean, exactly yes. what they made the character out to be was this killer that had a great accomplishment but never got the fame he deserved exactly i mean black christmas is cited as being you know inspiration for the slasher genre you know if, if there was a first person pov you know in halloween well black christmas did it first well i you know stuff like okay that. everyone here knows i fucking love that movie okay yep. if that if eugene is billy it changes like well now it, he is for i mean in my mind he is now it changes everything like this is my top leslie uh, behind the mask is in my top 10 favorite movies now just because billy's in it um but, uh, oh go ahead oh i was just gonna say you know um 
speaking of you know slasher heroes um also in this movie is of course robert england Ooh, baby robert england you know what freddy cougar for being on a shoestring budget getting kane hotter robert england zelda like oh, oh, oh they must have the best people in the entire world because there's no way they're paying these guys what they usually go for sure man i mean i think behind the mask was you know, obviously it was a passion project, right? Well, so they must I think have loved the script. Obviously that's, that might, that must be where it starts. Probably. Yeah. I would imagine so. I mean, not so much Kane Hodder actually, because he doesn't even have a line. He just closes a door, but yeah, he's in the movie for like 30 seconds, but still, uh, I mean, Robert England had a pretty substantial role in this oh, yeah. movie. And I mean, he's, he was the star power, you know, behind this. I mean, he's like, aside from Scott Wilson, who's been in like every movie known to man, uh, I mean, he's like the recognizable name in this movie. Everybody knows who Robert England is. Everybody knows who Freddy Krueger is. I mean, if you're, you know, into even, you don't even have to be a huge horror fan like we are. You should know who Robert England is, even if it's not uh, as Freddy. He's been in so many fucking things. It's even that's the same thing with Scott Wilson. Like, if you don't know him from Walking Dead or or even from this film we're talking about tonight, you know him from something else, whether you think you do or not. Absolutely. All right, so yeah. who else do we got here? We got Zelda. Yep, Zelda Rubenstein, uh, famous for being uh, in Poltergeist. Um, you know, was she's it the first kinda... one or Poltergeist two? I want to say she was in both of them. Actually. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. And her famous line, "Head towards the light, Carol Ann." Right, that high pitched kind of weird voice. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away in 2010, so that's another one we don't have here with us anymore. Yep, 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 yep. All right, so we got the we got the three veteran actors out of the way. So let's talk about the broads and the bros here. Um, you know, I think we're gonna go bros this time. I think we went broads last time. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, let's go into that. Who do we got here? It, it's hey, you know what? It's a tiny cast. Okay, I think this is the smallest cast it we is. have in a movie we've talked about so far. I think so. Yeah. Oh well, no, maybe Halloween. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Mm, yeah, Halloween I think was probably smaller. Um, let's see. Yeah, there were maybe like eight people yeah. <laughs> in that movie all together. Um, so I guess we'll start with the uh, the people you see the least. We can talk about Britain Spellings as Todd and Doug Pace as Doug. You know, oh Ben Pace as Doug. Sorry, I yeah, they're the same. They're like one character. Right. Well, I mean, they're really like the R two D two and C three PO of this movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, I mean, they're they're Taylor's sidekicks. They're her film crew. You know, things like this. So they really are there to kind of play off of each other. Well, it, actually, you know what? It's kind of weird. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't remember them really conversing until it goes third person. Like usually, it's um, for example, when they're in the library and uh, Leslie's setting up that whole bit where he's going to does he kill? Um, Mrs. Collinwood. I don't remember. Because he's kind of just standing. Well, s- well, I remember the scene, so like, I don't. I just can't recall if there was a sound effect or anything. But Kelly looks up, and then Leslie's behind Mrs. Collinwood, and then Miss Collinwood just falls. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, like, I think. Yeah, I think it's implied that he does kill her. Okay. Yeah. Um. So yeah, like in before that happens, uh, I don't know where Doug is at, but Todd's filming the whole like parkour through the library as he's planting the newspaper, the face fake newspaper clipping. And uh, Todd is creepy, calling Kelly like super hot, like he just won't shut up about how hot she is. And it's Taylor that's telling him, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. I don't even know where Doug was in that whole ordeal. Like he didn't say a thing the entire time. Yeah, I don't know, man. He was like off camera, probably doing something or he was there and he would just wasn't saying anything maybe he was just in awe of what he was seeing yeah um i don't know i didn't really like the i just didn't think todd was funny i'm just gonna uh, i didn't think he was funny and the, the things he was saying were kind of annoying it was really the only thing that really took me out of the movie sometimes where like when shit was going down with taylor todd and doug um he was making jokes still like you're all about to die like cut the shit Let's get down to business here. We got to get the fuck out of here. And you're talking about how Kelly was riding her boyfriend's pogo stick. Yeah. Um, I mean, I understand the need for some comic relief, right? I mean, I think every movie should have a little bit of humor, especially horror movies. Yeah. Um, but there's a time and a place for it. And it just, it seemed uh, 
like that dialogue wasn't quite in the right spot, yeah. you know? It was really out of place. Like, they just found out that they were about to be killed. They just found out that they were now part of the equation. Right. I mean, if it were me, I'd be freaking the fuck out, you oh, Absolutely. Know? <laughs> like, for instance, Doug, he was definitely freaking the fuck out. He's like, all right, we need to get the hell out of here. They head to the barn. He acts like a hero for some reason. I think he says he loves Taylor or something, and he has to go through him. And then he lives, I guess. Yeah, he lives because he just gets his head hit up against the wall. Which, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, Leslie also must have planned to not kill him. You know, if this movie was set up for anything, it was set up for a sequel, for sure. And you know what? We want that so bad. Anybody watching does not have any idea how bad I want that sequel. I want it so bad. Well, at the end of the movie, I mean, it really sets it up for the sequel, oh, right? Because there's, there's no getting around that. Yeah, I and mean, credits are rolling, right? Leslie is quote unquote. I'm doing air quotes here. Corpse <laughs> gets you know wheeled into the to the um, funeral home. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Morgue. Uh, morgue. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. Wheeled into the morgue. Right, and then he like sits up and kills the dude, and like looks up at the camera, so yeah, he's yeah, yeah. still alive. And also, like they point at the, um, well, I guess we're going into Nathan Basil now. Um, the you know that he, he talks about when he's putting on his makeup, how it makes your fa- uh, the the um, the uh, paste he was putting on is he mixed in some fire retardant with it, and she set him on fire in the barn. He has fire retardant on his face. He yep. clearly said it, so he's fine. Yep, I love that scene, by the way, when Nathan Basil is, like, painting up his face, and he's just talking to himself and kind of, yeah, like, yeah, making yeah. faces in the mirror. Well, you know so what? great. It, well, I, I'm sure, I don't know if Dan remembers this. He might have been drunk when we watched this movie for the first time, but when we were watching it, like, we were saying, like, wow, like, this dude is such a good actor, and now that we've talked to him and stuff and uh, learned that he went to Juilliard and stuff like that, like, I totally see it now, because he was, like, I was blown away. Like, the scene yeah. where he was talking about how happy he was that it was finally happening. I was like, Jesus Christ, this guy is actually happy this is happening right now. Yeah, right? I mean, it's just... I've always been really impressed with Nathan Basil's performance. Yeah, it was always know, a shock movie. to me that that was... This is the only movie I know him from, or even TV show, anything. I mean, he was fantastic. I mean, dude's an absolute sweetheart, and I think he uh, portrayed that very well in the scene and then when he got all dark and serial killery um that just went to go show a whole other side uh of man the duality of the coin the the dear sweetheart who's just like everybody's like best friend and then boom your worst nightmare uh so how do we feel about the mask like i want you to rate okay blake i want you to rate right. the mask the leslie vernon mask w- would you say it's in your top 10 I would because it's so interesting. Okay, so I, I want mean, you to show. I want you to tell me what it's in between, not your top ten, but like what what mask is above or below that mask for you? Oh man, um, well, definitely, you know, top of the list, of course, is going to be the Michael Myers mask. Of course, that's a right hands Fo- down. Exactly, uh, followed up by Jason Voorhees' mask from Part Seven. That's my personal favorite one. Okay. Um, as far as masks go, dude, Jesus, I don't know what would be below it. I mean, it's definitely a good mask in terms of creepiness. Well, I'll tell you what. So I think that the ghost face mask would probably be below the Leslie Vernon mask. Okay. Um, just because the ghost face mask is such a novelty, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was widely available before Scream came out. So it was it wasn't unique in well, it was any like, way. It was like the Halloween technique, except they put no effort in at all. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's like, hey, we're just gonna get the rights to this yeah, mask. Ha uh-huh. Um, but the thing about the Leslie Vernon mask that's so interesting is just the the color of it, right? It's kind of like this weird teal color. Um it almost looks like a deformed or bloated baby. Yeah. See, right. That's, With like these tufts of hair sticking off of see, it. See, the, the thing that really freaked me out about it was the emotion. Like it's sad. I always thought yeah, that was yeah. so creepy. I, I, I was like, oh my God. Like I can't even imagine having something like that coming at me. But for me, <laughs> uh, I'd put the Alice Sweet Alice mask right below it. Um, even that, that's okay. another novelty one. You can get that at any Halloween shop anytime ever. Um, 
And then right above it, I'd say, I don't know. Let's just go with that. <laughs> I, I can't, it's really hard because, like you just said, you said uh, part seven, Friday the 13th. Like, there's so many goddamn masks I like from Friday the 13th. I can't put, like, all of them are in my top 10, basically. <laughs> so Yeah. Yeah, right? I mean, you could say, okay, so Halloween, and then, you know, to the layman, you yeah. could say Halloween too, but haha, joke's on you. They're the same yeah. mask. Uh, but you could also say, okay, the well, yeah, three, you know, Friday Jason Voorhees. Yeah, or eight. you could just say Jason's Jason's hockey mask. But it's like, okay, well, which one? Yeah, it matters. It right? We're matters. talking about, like, part three, part four. I mean, you, could be talking about, you could be talking about Uber Jason mask, and that shit does, right. not, does not fly with me, all right? God forbid somebody's talking about fucking Jason versus Freddy mask. I hate that mask. Hey, you know what? I and like for that the mask. Record, and you know what? I've said it before. I like that movie, okay? Yeah, I know you like that movie. I don't. And for the record, if anybody's listening that's in marketing, like Facebook ad marketing or whatever, stop putting Freddy versus Jason, no, yeah, Jason on no, that yeah, actually, shit. Actually, as a matter of fact, I'm really sick of seeing it, honestly. Because hey, you it's know what? the only I've one seen... you ever see. Hey, you know what? I've seen posts where companies like that or Fright Rags have put pictures of Freddy vs. Jason. Jason, just use the remake, Jason. What's the like? You're looking for a good quality picture. Just go for the remake. Exactly. That is my point. There are better Jasons out there and better Jasons for you than Freddy vs. Jason. Jason. I mean, the Freddy vs. Jason. Jason was not good. I'll say that. No. Okay, it wasn't was. Kane Hodder. It's not Kane Hodder. Get the fuck out of here. Okay. Robert yeah. England was yeah. Freddy. There you go. You did that right. But anyway, right. Nah, that was a rant. Anyway, <laughs> that was a rant. A little off-topic rant. You could tell that we both feel very passionate about this movie <laughs> for different reasons. But still, I digress. Uh, yeah, so so let's... You know what? I was thinking about... Um, so when I first went into watching this movie, I was doing research on it. And this this has to do with the sequel thing we were just talking about. Nathan Basil did his own video. I think it was called Before the Mask, where he plays this, the same character just... It's on a YouTube video a channel somewhere. I don't even know what the channel is. I guess I can put that in the description too. But um, I was thinking maybe it would be another origin story of a serial killer, not necessarily Leslie Vernon for a sequel. Really? Yeah, I I I, I kind of like that idea. I guess I I wouldn't in any other circumstance, you know. But or maybe like a thing where I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, the possibilities for a sequel for this movie are endless. Like, it's so different from every other horror movie that you could do whatever you wanted. And it's not like this huge... It's a cult. It's Obviously, it has a cult following, but there's no mass fan base to disappoint. Right. So, okay. So, in terms of your idea, you're thinking, like, using the title of Behind the Mask, but a different That's, serial yeah, killer yeah, with exactly, every movie? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Oh, okay. Or no, maybe Leslie cool. Vernon's teaching this guy how to do it. Who knows? Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, who knows? It could be anything. All right, cool. Well, what we're going to do then is we're going to pitch this to Scott Glosserman and see yeah. what he thinks. <laughs> yeah, we'll have him write up the script, and then uh, we'll go from there. Word. As long as we get story credits, we'll be okay. Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right. So moving on from the bros. Well, we didn't t- really talk about... Well, we did talk about Nathan Basil, uh, but we're going to have well, that, the interview I mean, that with whole him thing here was just shortly. Basil. Yeah, and we got we had a, we had <laughs> a good true. discussion with him. You'll, you'll hear it in a few minutes. So Yeah, absolutely. I mean, other than that, we pretty much covered the bros. I mean, we got Robert England and Scott Wilson, Nathan Basil, and then, you know, Doug and Todd. Uh, but other than that, we've got the, we've got the, the girls here to talk about. The, the broads, ladies, if the broads, you will. The broads. The broads. I want to start with Bridget Newton as Jamie. What a confusing character, okay? Now, if we are going by the Billy idea, then where the fuck does she come in? Because she said she made some implications that she was he was trying to kill her at one point, got away, and then they kind of hooked up after, right? Yeah, so it's kind of implied that she's the final girl from Black Christmas, and I mean, if that's the case, then the name's different. But then well, also, yeah, also of course, yeah, yeah, he changed his name too, or did he? We don't even know if Billy's name is Billy. So, right for sure. Where's the baby Billy? Don't tell him what we did, Agnes. But yeah, I don't know. Like, well, she was a really good character. First of all, I liked how she was kind of helping out. She's like a, uh, like a, a, a co-coach for uh, Leslie, like. She gave the idea of Mrs. Collinwood as a, uh, I forgot what the word he, he used for it, but um, 
as the first person to kill and get her attention, like to really let him know, let her know he was there. Right, for sure. Yeah, no, she's definitely an interesting character. She's kind of like a slasher soccer mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of, right? She's like you know, rooting everybody she's... on. Yeah, exactly. You know, she has such a cheery disposition. You know, she knows what her husband is slash was. She knows what Leslie is, and she's going along with it. But still, like, I can't get past the whole... I mean, there's going to be some holes. Like, obviously, they're not going to just give it to us unless it, they really just confirm it. But, all right. So, moving on. Uh, obviously, we got Kate Miner as Kelly. Um, she couldn't be more irresponsible. That's that's my take on Kelly. <laughs> right? Yeah. For somebody who is touted as, you know, the intended victim, the final girl, the perfect girl... Definitely irresponsible. She's the you think exact... of Final Girls. Oh, sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Uh, you think of Final Girls. You think of Laurie Strode. You think of Alice Hardy. Right, all these girls that are you know Sydney. upstanding and forthright, and Sydney Prescott from Scream. You know, and she is not any of those, which plays in, of course, to the twist of the movie. But still, um, which is why this movie is great because it really shows you one hand, doesn't show you what the other one has, and the other one really has you know what's really going and on, and then kicks so. you straight in the balls. That's right. Um, yeah, exactly what you were saying. She's the exact opposite of what Leslie was describing her at, to be. Like, you know, actually, the weird part to me was that Leslie was putting in all this like great uncle work and convincing Kelly that this was like all about her. Like, he didn't have to go as far as he did. He knew they were going to go to that house and party. So, like, at what point does he decide? Okay, this is enough. Or he should go through and do it more. Maybe it was more just for convincing Taylor. Probably, I would imagine. But then again, she knows nothing about the business anyway, so he could just get her there and no matter what. It doesn't even matter. I don't know. Maybe I'm looking into it too much, but... Probably, because <laughs> um, fucking Taylor... A court, like, when I think of what's going on in Leslie's head, it was never about... Um... Uh, Kelly. Yeah, it was always yeah. about Taylor, which is why he decided to sneak in close to try something new because that's not necessarily anything we've seen so far, except for like maybe Scream One. Um, so where it's, uh... okay, let me ask you guys this: Was having all those kids there just to get the number up, or what? Because... You got to work on the numbers. Well, it, it, you, it you must gotta be. Work on... It must be a number thing because he could have just killed them all right there when they showed up. It didn't matter. It was all part of his intricate plan. That final showed. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm thinking maybe it was just to outshine all the other dudes that did it before him, and like. Probably, yeah. Because he could have just done it. He could have done it a number of times. They went back to the house. God knows how many times they did all those interviews there. Who knows? Maybe you, you know what? Maybe the documentary was a huge part of it for him, so it could all be documented. Because nobody else had it documented before unless the movies exist in those universes, which I wouldn't understand why they would, but... See, I think you're thinking too deep into it. I think you guys aren't thinking too deep. Uh, you guys aren't thinking deep enough. No, because if you start thinking too deep into it, you're going to poke holes in this movie and then you're not going to like it anymore. No, I'll definitely like it still, but it's meta, dude. You gotta you gotta dig into it. Of course you do. That's like what this podcast is. We're, we're talking about movies. We're digging into them. If... Listen, man, I need to know if he was the kids were there for numbers or not, all right? That's all I want to know. He could have killed Taylor any time. He mentioned the numbers numerous times, so I'm assuming it was for the number. I mean, I don't remember none of that, but whatever. We oh, wait, I'm thinking. No, I'm thinking of another movie. <laughs> you anyway, got to pump anyway. them numbers up. Them... Uh, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, those are rookie numbers. numbers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what I was thinking, because you brought up numbers, and I'm like... It does sound familiar. I'm in a yeah. ranting mood right now, okay? That's uh, all good. So, I mean, in terms of everybody there, I think it was part of Leslie's plot, and I think it was to have a body count of a certain number. You know, if, if he's basing it on, you know, say, like, Michael Myers or Freddy Krueger. Well, there's no competition yeah, I mean, if, there. If he, well, exactly. Well, I mean, if he's aspiring for numbers, you know, he's going to have to shoot high, and nobody's higher than Jason Voorhees. Yeah. You know, but I mean... If you, you know, I mean, like, Freddy Krueger has the the least amount of kills of all the slashers, right? I mean, Jason his are the what, most. like, five, four a movie, probably? If that. I mean, in the yeah. original Friday, there were, or not Friday, in the original Nightmare, there were, There's what, four, yeah. four people that were killed? Well, if you're, you know, not, if you're not counting the mom at the end. 
Yeah, exactly. If you're not counting her, then it's only three. The original Friday the 13th had ten. So, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it was just to pad his resume, right? Get get the body count going. And then, like you said, you know, at the end of this, he's either going to be dead, incarcerated or on the run. So he knew either way he was going to kill everybody except for one person. And that was his final girl. Well, he also didn't kill Doug. Or Doc Holleran. Well, I think he thought he killed Doc Holleran. I don't think he thought he killed Doug. He only hit his head up against the wall. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Is Doug shown at the end? Yep. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see Doug before you see Doc Holleran. Oh, okay. Well, perfect. So three survivors, Doc Holleran, Taylor, and Doug. So, I mean, you know, with... I don't see that being an accident. Well, then... Well, then Leslie's a shitty serial killer because you only leave... Well, that's what I'm saying. I don't see it being an accident. I think he's setting it up for something bigger. He has a bigger plan. The sequel, right? You know, so, that's probably yeah. why he put so much emphasis on the the apple. Um, what was it? What was it? What's that thing called? The apple court orchard. Yeah, whatever. The the fucking squeezer thing. He he put so much emphasis on it, but he didn't even kill anybody there. So he definitely made that emphasis for Taylor to use it. He probably rigged it. She thought he died. Just kidding. I'm alive still. Leaves before the fire starts. Oh, no, he was crispy, so in the morgue. So, no, he must have left after, but he had the fire retardant because he knew she was going to set it on fire. Right, exactly. again, nobody set a fire except for Taylor, so. Right. And it makes sense for Doc Holleran to live, to live, right? Because in the movie, Leslie calls Doc Holleran his Ahab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which is a reference, of course, to Moby Dick, right? Yep. Captain Ahab goes after the white whale, um, things like that. So, right, the the Ahab lives for the sequel, mm-hmm. much like Doctor Loomis. Yeah, exactly. And then the final girl's a no brainer. Doug will probably never see again. If we do, he'll um, get killed. You know, off I think he'll the be sequel. the first one. I think he'll be the first one, and yep. that'll trigger Taylor to go after uh, Leslie again. Sure. Yeah. Team up with with Doc Holler and yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's because uh, you know what, the, Doug not dying is no accident because he it, it, obviously Leslie knows what he's doing. He knows how to kill people. He knew, he definitely knew Doug wasn't dead. Doc Holler and maybe not, but definitely Doug. Right. For sure. I don't know. What do you think, Dan? Think there will be a sequel? I think uh, funding might be an issue. Yeah, I think. But that's they the left it open it. enough for. Uh, I think they left it open for a sequel just in case. I think that you know I don't even know what the budget was for Behind the Mask. All right, so I think we've talked about the movie enough now at this point, guys. Wouldn't you say? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, cool. So what we'd like to do now is present to you the interview that we did with Nathan Basil. Um, It was recorded before uh, this podcast a couple days ahead of time uh, just to make sure we could get it, you know, taken care of. Um, But yeah, so enjoy. And uh, we will definitely see you next time here on the Horror Spot podcast. All right, everybody, welcome back. Thank you for joining us. Um, This evening, we have a very special guest with us tonight on the Horror Spot podcast, Mr. Nathan Basil. Uh, He played Leslie Vernon in the movie Behind the Mask, uh, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. Welcome to Horror Spot, uh, Mr. Basil. Great to be with you guys. How are you doing? Uh, We're doing good. good. So you, uh, I read on your IMDb profile that you went to Juilliard, uh, the acting school. I did that. Yeah, what was that like? I was fantastic. It was four years of intense training, and that's what I went there for, and that's what I got. Nice. Very good. Uh, uh, this next question may be a little cliche, but uh, what made you want to be an actor? That's not cliche at all. I mean, I've answered <laughs> it a lot of times, but uh, yeah, I guess uh, the same reason that a lot of other people do it. They see their older siblings do it, and they feel like, well, oh, I, I like pats on the back, right? Sure, so. sure, sure. Uh, going going into acting was horror something you had your eyes on at all or no not at all I'd never done a horror been involved in a, any kind of horror project prior to that and uh, wasn't too too familiar with the genre because um, I'm I'm a scaredy cat so I don't <laughs> watch too too many horror movies um, I've gotten better since I did the movie because I felt like I had a responsibility to mm-hmm. um, at least. Uh, try to represent the the genre respectfully you know well Absolutely. i can definitely uh appreciate your um your stance on horror movies i'm not really a big uh, horror guy myself and haven't been for a while but you're, what... you're a fellow scaredy cat <laughs> oh yes sir um nick actually uh clockwork oranges me to watch uh quite <laughs> yeah. a few horror movies 
the rise of Leslie Vernon was um, one that I could handle quite well, actually, because it wasn't uh, the gore and the doom and gloom. And it actually put a unique spin on the horror genre, which I myself um, rather enjoyed. So yeah, I well, you know what? It had the same effect on me. Reading the script gave me uh, I have never been able to watch another horror movie the same uh, without without seeking out and identifying and uh kind of analyzing what conventions are at play and and um you know it's a little academic but i think for me it helps me build a little bit of a safe distance between me and the content you know when it gets a little too freaky for me i can i I can i can get a little uh a little heady which is comforting well i'm sure sure, like working like on a project itself really like brings out the the fakeness of it how nothing in the movie is actually real and everything like oh that. yeah sure no it's ar- totally artificial when you're when you're I, i've never watched behind the mask and gotten freaked out or grossed out or anything oh, yeah, by yeah. anything behind the mask it it's uh it's 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 yeah just not like that for me but uh with watching other movies um you know, you you just get carried away by the the experience of the thing, and horror is unlike any other kind of genre out there where what's at play is a really visceral experience. I mean, that's that's how you know a good horror movie is if it's played with you viscerally, and yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and so you 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 can't be casual uh, with a good good horror movie, you know. Sure, absolutely. Um, so with Behind the Mask, uh, there were a couple genre veterans um, that were in the cast, uh, including, of course, Robert England, um, Scott Wilson, and uh, Zelda Rubenstein. Uh, what was it like to work with them? Well, like you said, they were veterans, you know, so what mm-hmm. they were lending to our project just by their participation was legitimacy. And that's something that we were really hungry for is a really um, ambitious, independent movie, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so Robert England coming on board gives you just huge cred automatically. And uh, Zelda Rubenstein, as soon as anybody hears her voice, <laughs> um, all of the work that she's done from the rest of her career is lent to our project. Just sure. by Just by the quality of her voice that everybody identifies so well, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, Scott Wilson, I mean, that dude... <laughs> That dude was just in every movie. You look it up. If there's, you know, check out his IMDb sometime. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I dare you to not find 10 movies that you absolutely adore and probably didn't even know that he was in it. Exactly. Yeah, I just, uh, the other day, I just rewatched The Exorcist 3, and he was in that, and I had no idea that that he was in it. I was like, hey, that's Scott Wilson. Um, So saying that, uh, you know, backpedal a little bit how you were talking about being behind the scenes and how it kind of changed the movie for you were you ever interested in or for this that movie anyway the pre-production like everything that was going on before you actually started shooting oh yeah i was hungry to to be involved with as many of the aspects of production as possible and uh apart from the audition process i wasn't privy to be involved with any of the pre-production stuff but once we were on location um i was given you know backstage pass to everything that was going on and uh and i soaked it all up like a fucking sponge and then uh oh do you guys curse no yeah you can curse all you fucking yeah go ahead and then, uh, <laughs> and then the post process i was able to you know look over the editor's shoulder and the director as they were hammering things out and i mean that's just a, an incredible uh you know perspective on 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 the process, you know, because, you know, a movie, <laughs> you shoot the thing and then you cross your fingers, yeah, you know, because yeah. it's all it's all going to come together or not come together in the editing room. And, and we were really fortunate that at every step along the way, things came together, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what was that uh, audition process like um, for the role of Leslie Vernon? Uh, did you have to do anything to prepare for it or did you just kind of go in and hope for the best? Oh, uh, yeah, I went in and hope for the best. Mm-hmm. Um no preparations required for me to be a weirdo. <laughs> That's for the sure. only role that I've ever booked in my acting career has been the the weirdo. So, mm-hmm. hey man, that's okay. Everybody loves a weirdo. Hey, yeah, it's my every movie needs a weirdo. Sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. So, uh, no, I I felt like I connected with the role. Um, 
I, I feel that a lot of times, but with this project particularly, I felt like, um, look, you're never going to see another take like this. You're going to see different takes and you're going to see good other takes, but you're mm -hmm. never going to see anything like this. Sure. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I, I think I kind of forced them to have to rethink things a little bit, um, mm -hmm. when they were considering me for casting because, um, I, I was, I was, I was making some choices that were diverting from ones that they had already kind of made. And, um, I, I'm, I'm really ever grateful for them that they, it, it was really courageous of them to let go of the idea that they had of what the movie was and to go with a completely different idea, um, midstream. I mean, that probably doesn't happen uh, a lot and, uh, probably for good reason. <laughs> In this case, I, I, I'd like to think it was it was for a good cause, but, you know, time will tell. So, question. I've heard that there's uh, a few rumors about a sequel to Behind the Mask. Do you heard anything about that? Or are you involved with that at all? Yeah, I heard that, too. Oh, okay. Oh, great. So we have I was hoping still. you knew. I was hoping I could pump you for some info on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even no. if there were, you probably wouldn't tell us anyway. Let's be real here. <laughs> uh no i would really really tell you um no it's it's been it's been such a you know laborious pro look uh, when we when we did the first one we had zero budget and mm -hmm. still it took forever to raise it and when you're talking a sequel and you're talking a movie that deals in in horror conventions and you're talking about a sequel necessarily being bigger and bolder and more explosions and more blood and more bodies and all that stuff. Cause you have to have that cause it's a convention. Sure. Um, you're talking about just blow blowing the walls off of your, your prior productions budget. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, the, the kind of capital that you have to raise is insane. And we looked at, a, we looked at a studio route and um, that looked hopeful for a bit. And that, didn't pan out maybe that's in the future i don't know but um we look to do self-funding um and that again didn't didn't uh pan out so i i don't know what the answer is i i don't know if there's ever going to be a sequel um we did a we, we released a, a comic book uh recently that is a um uh you know comic book version of the uh sequel script Mm -hmm. uh, at least the sequel script as it was written in 2008 or maybe 2009, mm -hmm. um, which is a really cool way to get a little taste of what the sequel would be like. Obviously, we would we would deviate from that in the in yeah, a realized production. But, um, you know, that's that's a fun little window at, at what where we would be taking the story. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the meantime, getting another film off the ground, I don't know. Fortunately, it's way above my pay, pay grade. I, I, I don't, <laughs> I'm not privy to any of the financial shit. I don't have to make that any of my concern. I just show up and I say words, you know. So um, sure. it's, it's somebody else's job to, to figure out all the, all the I's that need to be dotted and T's crossed. You know, I'd mm -hmm. say with the uh, current resurgence of horror movies, um, with like Get Out and Quiet Place and now Halloween just – blew the roof off the place sure i'd say soon or now or even the near future would be a perfect time to push out a sequel yeah so you're cutting a check oh yeah no no <laughs> i would man if i could afford oh yeah if it, i had but... money absolutely <laughs> if i had won that mega millions lottery boy you bet <laughs> i thought i thought that's what we were talking about here guys hey you know what we're gonna have to make some uh some phone calls all right all right yeah. let me know um so, fun fact: uh, a lot of the a lot of the filming locations were up here in Oregon, um, and I was look I was looking through um, some of the locations, and it looks like you guys actually shot in my hometown of St. Helens. Um, oh, yes, we did. Oh yes, indeed. That was, yep. I believe, our first location that we were shooting in. Yeah, right on. Yep. Yep. yep, it's it's a it's a quaint little hamlet, that's for mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fun to grow yeah, up in. If I remember correctly, yeah. we uh, we shot a run walk scene. Um, there was a bit that never made it in the film, but uh, but uh, it, it was a bit where uh, Leslie's chasing Taylor mm -hmm. and doing the run, and then she turns around yeah. and looks back, and he's walking, and 
and then we're running and then she turns back to look at That's him cheating. and he's walking yeah <laughs> and uh so we shot that scene uh i believe in uh in that town and um we weren't able to use that footage so we had to reshoot it at a different location and we weren't able to use that footage either it just oh jeez yeah it didn't work out I actually saw that today on YouTube. It was pretty. I was pretty surprised that it wasn't put in the film at all. Well, it was a. It was just a, a bit that we couldn't get clean enough, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A couple other movies have been filmed out there. Um, Halloween Town, which is a Disney classic. Uh, parts of Twilight were filmed out there. Mm -hmm. um, so real interesting little area to film in, kind of off the beaten path, I would imagine. Well, I know it's off the beaten path. I grew up there. Yeah, man. So what's what's new for uh, what's new for Nathan Basil? What are you working on nowadays? Um, mostly teaching. I have an acting studio in L.A. Cool. And uh, yeah, um, uh, Deviate Studios. So DeviateStudios.com. Look it up. But uh, yeah, yeah, I teach acting, and that's <clears throat> what I love doing. And I dare say that I enjoy it more than I enjoy action <laughs> acting. So sure. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a uh, that's that's what I do. Well, I'm sure there's there's some sort of uh, more of a personal um, gain for you to be able to teach others how to do it instead of going out and doing it yourself. Yeah, I think that was probably the part that uh, turned me off uh, a little bit was that it was all about me. I mean, obviously that 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 satisfies a certain part of me, uh, ego related. Yeah. But um, but yeah, no. Being a contribution to somebody else is definitely something that uh, it's a better organizing principle, don't you think? So I've met uh, Robert England before, and I know that he's a big talker. Um, <laughs> he can just talk forever. Did you uh, kind of find that he would just talk your ear off sometimes, or did you have a lot of interaction with him at all? Uh, no, no, he he was uh, he kind of kept to himself. I'm yeah. talking with you. No, he talks. <laughs> That's what he does, man. You, yes, he does. You don't even need. He doesn't even need another person in the room to have a conversation that is fascinating. Every single word coming out of his mouth is mm -hmm. magnetic. Oh yeah, the dude is he's is so just smart. oh my goodness. He's just he's he's a he's a he's a rolodex of references and information and uh, and he doesn't stop buzzing. You no, know, ever. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's it's fascinating to be around the guy. I've I've always. I've always enjoyed every opportunity that I've had and, and have felt privileged for, you know, the proximity that I've been allowed to, to that guy. Cause he's, uh, he's, he's one of a kind, man. You are never going to find another fellow like Robert England. Yeah. I met him in 2015 at a convention and it was, uh, shortly after Wes Craven passed away, but I had gotten tickets for, a. Uh, uh, like a screening of the first Nightmare on Elm Street, and he and Amanda Weiss were there, and he came out after after the screening for a Q and A. And man, you just ask him one question, and like thirty minutes later, he'll and you know he'll be done with his answer if that. <laughs> but yeah. it's but it's cool, right? It's not like annoying. It's really like you said. I mean, every word is just magnetic. It's just fascinating well, look, to watch him reach guy, back. That guy came on location, and just his participation in our movie that alone was mm -hmm. huge. Sure. He had every right in the world to show up, clock in and clock out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he showed up on day one and took us out for drinks and chatted us up. And he paid for the drinks. Nice. <laughs> he paid for the privilege of talking to us. <laughs> I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Like the entire crew or just yeah. like, no? Oh, oh no, okay. no, no, no. <laughs> All that right. would have been uh, that would have been something else, wouldn't it? Oh. No, it was, it, yeah, I, I was I was privileged to uh, to be part of the the small party, but um, yeah, I mean, and then you know we're we're doing the work, and he's got so much experience, and he's got so much uh, you know access to references, and he, he's just uh, you know to have him watch what I was doing mm -hmm. and to sanction it, you know. To not yeah. just sanction it, but to be, he's been one of our biggest cheerleaders, you know? Hell yeah. Uh, it's, that's huge. Um, For sure. So, speaking of that, he talked a whole bunch. Did, uh, did you get a lot of <laughs> tips from him and stuff like that, or ask him for help since you were new to the genre and everything? No. Um, we were doing the band scene. You know the band scene? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The choke. Yep. And, uh, he had been shooting a scene, and he stuck around to, to watch, uh, 
what the hell he'd gotten himself into, I guess. And uh, <laughs> he was watching that scene, uh, and he was kind of standing off with uh, the the rest of the crew, and and uh, he popped over in between takes, and he was like, "Look, what you're doing is is really fantastic, and you remind me of a uh, young Anthony Perkins." Ooh, Does anybody ever nice. see that? Ooh. Yeah. Wow. Come on. Shut up. So that uh, from 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 that moment on, I felt like okay, I'm <laughs> I, I'm I'm not just uh, you know dutifully doing my business as an actor. I, I'm 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 tapping into something you know um, really really fant- interesting and interesting not just to me, but to, it's interesting to other people. So hell yeah, uh, that, that was really the first time that I felt like uh, you know what we, we we might be able to pull this off here. Very cool. Very, very cool. Um, well, yeah, man. I, I mean, uh, I love chatting with you, Mr. Basil. It's awesome. I don't have any more questions. Um, but yeah, this has been really fun. I am uh, glad talking to you guys and, uh, thanks for your interest in the film. I appreciate it. Always. Hey, well, Always. We appreciate the film for sure. Awesome. Well, uh, keep on spreading the love, right? All right, my friend. Well, you have a good evening and, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks guys. You too. You Take- have a good one. Take care.